So today we're going to finish this chapter. Only two things we want to learn today. One is actually the most famous Arrhenius equation. So this equation basically summarizes all the relevant parameters that's going to affect your chemical reaction kinetics. Anything that's not mentioned in that equation is irrelevant for the chemical kinetics. And then once we finish that, what we're going to do is actually we're going to talk about the catalyst. So we're going to tell you, okay, what does the catalyst do? How it actually affects the chemical kin kinetics? So it's more conceptual things because all the concept that we're going to mention today is really this guy. So let's actually the most important equations that you need to actually memorize. Okay, the things that you have feeling, I believe, is actually uh, when you do maybe you cook things or maybe you actually do some chemical reactions most of the time you'll find that if you actually increase the temperature this the specific uh, process will speed up so how can you actually explain those things scientists actually spend a lot of time to give you this equation so on the left you see a term k right the k is actually the things you are very familiar with it is the it's just the rate constant right so larger the K, that means actually the process move forward faster. So the rate constant is actually related to two terms. You have these A terms, and then you have these exponential terms. Okay, they have different physical meanings. So the A terms, okay, is so-called the frequency factor. It describes two things. For a reaction to occur, the first thing that needs to be achieved is actually the reactor need to actually collide with each other, right? So the collision frequency, okay, is actually one of the very important things that you need to know. Okay, so let's actually the first things that you should know about the A, okay, it, it contains the information about how frequent the reactor actually collide with each other. There's another thing that's very important is actually when these two things they are colliding with each other, okay. In order to map a reaction to eventually occur, these two things actually collide in the proper orientation. Another thing is the Z. Okay, so Z is actually the director must have the proper orientation. So these two things need to be actually satisfy simultane simultaneously so that the reaction can occur. The terms that you have this E, negative EA over RT. Okay, so this term is so-called the exponential term. Okay, then you can see that there are actually two important parameters inside this exponential term, right? One is EA, one is T. EA is the activation energy. And the T is the temperature. To understand this, we're just going to start with an example so we can actually uh, make sense of all those parameters. OK, so we use these reactions, CH3N3, is going to I summarize into CH3CN. Okay, structure wise, it looks like this. This looks like, okay, you have carbon center attached to three hydrogen and then attached to a N and a C. Okay, that's your reactant, right? And your product is Yes. Okay, so it's kind of like just changing the orientation of this. When scientists actually start this reaction, they believe this reaction go through a transition state where scientists propose it should be something like this. Then you have these very special symbols right here. They believe the reaction should actually go through this and then go to here. So let me make it bigger. You can see it clear. So every time you see something labeled with this, this is something called the transition state. 
So whenever you call a species is existing in the transition state, okay, what it means is first it is not isolatable. It means actually when you do the experiment, you can actually really isolate the species. We just propose there's actually something exists very transiently. So we are going to use this as an example to explain this diagram. Okay, so this diagram is actually a very important diagram. You need to actually know how to draw this diagram yourself. It's very important. You're going to see examples of this uh, diagrams in your homework and the midterm for sure. What other important thing is actually you need to know first, know the x and y axis. Okay, what is your x axis? What does that mean? Time, right? So like you start from react and you end up with the product. So it's describe the progression of the reactions, right? Sometimes you will see things actually labeled differently. Sometimes they will just say this is actually a reaction axis. But it means the same thing. It means actually the reaction goes from your reactant to the product. So let's say your x axis, right? What is your y axis? Energy of the species. It's not the energy of the overall reaction, it's actually energy of the species. So what that means is actually, okay, you start from your reactant, right? You end with your product. This actually represent what? Represent the energy of your reactant. This represent the energy of your product. So if it, if it just show a very simple curve like this, go from your reactant and end up with your product, you just have a one line connected with that. So once you do this, okay, you can first calculate the energy of your reaction, which is your Delta H of reaction, right? That's actually the enthalpy of your reaction. How do we calculate this? It's actually the enthalpy of your product minus the enthalpy of your reactant, right? It's less simple. Okay, so figure wise is actually if you just draw, uh, it's just extend your energy line of your reactant. Okay, then you know. The differences between your reactant and product. The energy difference between your reactant and the product that give you your delta H of reaction. The other thing is actually, you see this, you need to actually get over a certain energy so that reaction can occur, right? So the highest energy point of this curve was defined as the that is your transition state. So the energy difference between the highest energy of your transition state and your reactant was defined as the activation energy. So this is what? This is a endo or exothermic reaction. This is exothermic, right? How about the endothermic reaction? Let's draw these things out. Very good questions, okay? That is your reactant. That is your product. That is the endothermic reaction, right? If I have a curve like this, okay. The delta H will be this is your delta H reaction, right? That will be your EA. We are going to extend this concept a little bit more. Again, start from your reactant and with your product. If you see a curve like this, okay, so that is the energy curve of your reaction. Do you know how to calculate your delta H? It's still the same, right? The energy differences between your reactant and product. Okay, so you know the things you use to calculate your delta H is still this, right? This is your, your delta H of reaction. Where is actually your activation energy? 
the highest point, okay? So it's actually here to here. That is actually your EA, right? So what is this? Yes, okay. So in this reaction, how many transition states do you have? Three transition states you have, all right? Now this is actually new, okay? The question I'm going to ask now is actually new. What are this? So this species means actually they are actually what? Energy-wise, they're actually at the local minimum, right? That means they can be actually experimentally isolatable, okay? You can actually really pull these things out, okay? So this is so-called the intermediate. Okay, so how many intermediates in this case? Two. Okay, so these are the type of questions you're going to ask in your homework. How many transition states? How many intermediates? What is the delta H of the reaction? What is your EA? That's pretty much all you need to know for this plot. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about this equation, okay? So we need to actually start to actually make sense of these two terms. So let's talk about the exponential factor term first. So in this exponential terms, you can see on the top is actually your activation energy, right? At the bottom is actually temperature. Let's look at how temperature is going to affect these terms. The first is actually assuming our temperature is infinity high. Ea over Rt is going to approach to zero, right? So we know your exponential term will become something like this. It's going to roughly equal to one. The second extreme is actually if your temperature approach to zero, then your Ea over Rt is going to approach to infinity, okay? Therefore, you know your exponential term will be exponential to the negative infinity. This is going to give you a number of, this is actually equals to What is one divided by infinity? Yeah, it's basically zero, right? So you know at the high temperature, okay, your exponential term give you one. At very low temperature, your exponential term give you zero, right? That means what? That means your your exponential term always between zero and one. The reason it is actually below zero and one because it's because that. This term is going to describe how many molecules okay, has energy that's actually above certain energy. The energy I'm talking about here is actually very specific. That is what? Activation energy. This term is going to tell you, okay, how many of the molecules okay, in your system has energy higher than your activation energy? Because only those molecules can actually have over they jump and then go to your product. That's why it is actually uh, between zero and one. Tell you what is the percentage of molecule can eventually lead to the product. So every time when you turn up the temperature of your reaction, what you really do is actually you just create more high energy molecules that can actually jump over the active energy barrier that give you the product. So let's say the exponential turn, right? The other part is actually this uh, activation energy. Okay, so like we, I mentioned in the previous slide, okay, it contains two terms too, right? One is actually how free can your, your reactant to actually encounter with each other. The other one is actually how they actually orient uh, respect to each other, okay? So the things, I, I think the collision frequency is actually easy to imagine, okay? The difficult part is actually the orientations, okay? In order to understand that, we need to actually use this example, okay? So this example describes, okay, if you have two HCl molecule, okay? They want to interact with each other and form the H2 and the Cl2. Okay, so assuming they're actually going to collide, okay, they can collide in two different ways. Okay, so first way is actually this is actually your reactant molecule one, this is your reactant molecule two, right? So they can actually collide with 
the hydrogen on the left, chloride on the right. Okay, the other one is actually again hydrogen on the left, chloride on the right. Okay, for nature collide, okay, it's actually this guy is going to collide into that guy, right? So in this case, you won't be able to actually produce your H2OCO2 because the one they actually encounter with each other is actually H and Cl, right? So the best situation you can get is actually going to produce HCl, okay? But that's not the product that you want, okay? So it means actually this orientation is not a proper orientation that you want to have for the product you want to form, okay? So that's what I mean by the proper orientation, okay? In order to actually produce your product, okay, you need to have your two molecules oriented like this, okay? So it's actually CLH encounter HCl. So once they collide, H and H can actually see each other. Then they can form the bond between each other. So they eventually lead to your H2, right? Another situation you can have is actually your HCl comes in with CLH, right? So in this specific case, you're going to form the Cl2 molecules. OK, so that's the basic idea. OK, your A contains two parts. One is actually just the collision frequency. The other one is actually the proper orientation. OK. So let's actually one more things that you want to think about it, OK, which is actually the unimolecular reaction. OK, because when you have unimolecular reactions, okay, typically it's actually a decomposition reaction. In that case, your A, since you're not going to collide with each other, right? You just dissociate yourself, okay? So the collision frequency is not important in this case, okay? The proper orientation is going to be replaced by the proper vibrational mode, okay? So for a molecule to actually dissociate, okay? typically it's actually through this vibration motions, okay? Then the A in that case is going to describe, okay, is that is in the right proper vibration mode that will lead to the product, okay? So, but for the bi bimolecule reactions, okay, then we actually get back to normal, okay? So A is going to relate it to your P and Z, right? Where Z is actually the collision frequency and your P is actually the orientation factors. Okay, so let's actually the physical meanings behind these equations. 